All right, class, welcome to the uh, now recorded exam review. I apologize when I tested the uh, YouTube live out last week. Worked great, no problems. But then when I tried to fire it up today, all I got was the spinning circle and uh, nobody able to see me. So I apologize for that. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to record a generic uh, review of me going through the study guide today. Hopefully that'll answer most people's questions. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, please email me or Josh, get me those list of questions. What I'm going to do is compile a new video tomorrow completely of the questions that people have uh, emailed me during the day today. Uh, once again, the exam will be posted on Wednesday morning, first thing. Feel free to log into the, into Wild Courses for that. You will not need a lockdown br browser because I know there are a lot of issues with that. It's going to be about 20 multiple choice, same as before, five different options for that one, and uh, four to five open-ended kind of short answer questions that you'll have to synthesize. No time limit. Just go in there. Uh, do your best. You are on the honor system. You know, I would think that if you want to get the best use of your time and best use of this class overall. You do uh, some good time studying today and tomorrow and not use any other resources while you're taking the exam. So that would be my recommendation. So let's get into the study guide and we'll start with number one here. Uh, hopefully you guys are able to see that screen that I'm manipulating as well. Um, so for our carbohydrate metabolism, this goes back to these first guys right here, A through C, all go to lecture, I think it's this guy right here. Oh, wait, one more, this one. It all goes back to this figure that we were looking at in our notes right there. We now have to know our three ways, which we have right down here, our insulin signaling, and then our two methods of contraction mediated, one through our ADP and adenylate kinase, and also through our calcium signaling right over here. So those are gonna be the three ways that we're gonna be able to do that. Then, if we move on over, after IRS1, which you'd be able to find on there, and GLUT4 as well, that transporter, structural organization of glycogen, and then what it would be able to define these two things. This, we're going to move on to our next lecture right here, glycogen storage and breakdown. Here we go. That all starts here. The main thing we're dealing with right there is talking about this branch structure of glycogen. Why is that important? Because right as we have here on our note, the branches are important because it releases glucose more quickly. Remember, we did the exercise in class. Oh, I remember those times when we used to be able to have class together. Um, when we had different people break off from the end of our chain and be able to move to a different area. And remember, as we created more branches, more people were able to move at one time. And that's the important part about that glycogen uh, branching. The big thing there being the difference of the uh, types of bonds. We have our 1-4 bonds right there between the 1 and 4 carbon. And then we have our 1-6 bonds that are right there between the 1 and the 6 carbon. Okay, and that relates down to specifically our different types of enzymes that are associated with forming glycogen. Okay, number one, we have our glycogen, and this is kind of the starter. If we didn't have any glycogen to start with, if we were trying to start a new big molecule like this over here, we would start with glycogen because that's going to make our first eight sequences of that UDP glucose next to each other with nice 1-4 linkages, okay? Once we have that eight uh, unit base, we can then use synthase to add one glucose to existing kind of uh, subunit that's already there. So if you already have that chain of eight that was formed by glycogenin, now synthase can just add one at a time right onto that nice chain. Well, eventually what you need is you need branching enzyme to come in there at the end and make those branches. If we didn't have branching enzyme, then you wouldn't have these branches that we see just like that. So the branching enzyme is what creates those alpha-1-6 bonds. Otherwise, synthase is just making more, uh, a longer chain using those alpha-1-4 linkages. Okay, let's go back to our review sheet. Enzymes of glycogen breakdown and synthesis. We already talked about the ones for synthesis, so we'll go back to breakdown real quick. And then the rate-limiting enzymes of glycolysis. Okay, 
So back to our glycogen storage. Here we go, our three that are related to breakdown are phosphorylase, transferase, and glucosidase, which is also called hydrolase, okay? So if we want, phosphorylase is basically the exact opposite of our synthase right here. Remember, synthase could add those one at a time to our already existing eight, eight uh, unit subchain. Now, our phosphorylase is taking one at a time off that end until you get to four carbons from a 1,6 bond. Once you get four carbons to a 1,6 bond, then you need a different enzyme. Now, here we get transferase. Transferase is going to take those, remember, and move them from a different part and a different branch and make a longer 1,4 uh, chain. Once that longer 1,4 chain is there, you can take one at a time off that once again. Now, when we get down to it, we're eventually going to have a 1,6 bond. That's what we're looking at over here. If we need to get rid of that last glucose or UDP glucose that's on there, that's where our glucosidase is going to come in. So if we had to create kind of a color for this one, there we go, because that's related to that last little linkage right there. Okay, let's go into some of our rate-limiting enzymes for glycolysis. Uh, was that in the same lecture? I think it was. Nope, just Cori cycle. Okay, lecture 13. Hold on. Glycolysis, we had our rate-limiting enzyme. This was in our previous section, but it was on this study guide for some reason. Remember, those are the three enzymes. Hexokinase right there, phosphofructokinase right there, and then also our pyruvate kinase right here. And we already talked about the three ways that those are regulated right there. So let's move back to our exam review. Okay. We talked about how those are regulated. Um, that probably won't be on this exam because that was on our first exam. So this probably was a carryover from last year when I had to change up the order a little bit. Okay, citric acid cycle. Pyruvate decarboxylation, TCA cycle will take place in the cell. All these questions go to our exam, our lecture 13. So here we are for that guy right here. There's our little Cori cycle that was talking once again about our our movement of uh, lactate, the parts that are not oxidized, what happens to them. We're more interested in the citric acid cycle. And remember, this is going to happen in our mitochondria overall. If we have this picture right here, we see the cell and we see that pyruvate moving into the cell and that is where this is going to take place. That pyruvate is first going to be decarboxylated. We're going to get rid of that one carbon dioxide. That's how we get our acetyl-CoA. And our acetyl-CoA is then what goes into our Krebs cycle. Okay, let's move back to the review. There we go. Do all cells have the same number and size of mitochondria? No, they do not. Think about the different types of muscles that you have. You're going to have a lot more, especially if you're a distance runner, in your quads than you uh, are slow twitch or more mitochondria overall in your quads and hamstrings and calves than you are going to have in your biceps because you're not using those, mu those muscles quite as much for aerobic activity. Uh, enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase, we talked about that. That's going to be related to moving that forward. We just talked about that guy right here. Pyruvate dehydro dehydrogenase. That's our decarboxylation enzyme. Final product is TCA and what happens to that? Our final product of TCA is going to be oxalastate. Remember that goes right back in. One rotation of TCA, we're going to get are three NADHs, one FADH2, and also some carbon dioxides and one GTP molecule or ATP. And we know that's going to be way different. Think about how that changes when we're referencing one molecule of glucose versus 
uh, C18 free fatty acid because with one molecule of glucose, remember you're getting two acetyl CoA's going in there. With one C18 free fatty acid fat uh, flowing in there, we're going to get nine acetyl CoA's from that through beta oxidation. Okay. Oxalacetates four, acetyl CoA two, alpha ketoglutarate. Let's go back. Let's look at our chart real quick. Is five. We've lost one carbon dioxide right there. There's our alpha ketoglutarate. Okay. Electron transport chain. Hopefully, you know how many complexes there are. There's five. Electron carrier are going to be our NADH or our FADH2, uh, and they come from the Krebs cycle. They can also come from glycolysis. We'll talk about that in a minute. How many are produced from one molecule of glucose? We already talked about this because we're going to get the one NADH from, or two NADHs from our glycolysis, and then we're going to get the rest, or three times two, from our uh, Krebs cycle right there. Uh, da -da -da -da. How many hydrogen ions pump through each of the complexes? This is an important one right here. How many hydrogen ions pump through each of the complexes? Remember, complex one, you get four hydrogens moving through for every electron. Complex two, none. There's no hydrogens moving through there because remember that protein that's integrated into the cell membrane doesn't go through to both sides. It's just on the inside uh, edge. It acts as kind of a transfer for electrons that were dropped off through NADH at complex number one. And then it will also act as an acceptor for electrons coming from FADH2. So uh, then we move on to complex three. That's going to be another four hydrogens coming from that guy. Move on to complex four. That's only two. And then at complex five, that's where our hydrogen ions are going to be used to create ATP coming back down the chain. Okay. Uh, coenzyme Q and cytochrome C, those are just our transporters. How many hydrogens need to move through complex five in order to complete to make one molecule of ATP? That's going to be four. And if it's four and we get 10 from one NADH, that means for every one single NADH, we get about 2.5 ATPs being able to be created. That builds into some of our math. NADH and FADH enter the electron transport chain. We just said that. Complex one and two, respectively. And how does this change the number of ATPs created? NADH is going to just create, uh, like we said, two and a half. If our FADH2, that's missing out on four hydrogens, so we're going to have one less ATP, so we'll have one and a half from that guy. Why can there be zero or eight hydrogens transported through complex one with the NADH produced during glycolysis? That has to do all with our transport. Remember, electron transport chains happening inside the mitochondria. If we have to get those NADHs from outside the mitochondria inside, if, depending on the type of transport that we use, we may have to give up some of the uh, potential energy within the NADH. In effect, turning that NADH into a FADH2. Therefore, we might get zero move through complex uh, number one with that NADH. The reason we have eight up there is because there are two NADHs created from glycolysis. It could be zero if both of them move through that, uh, I believe it's the malate transporter. Let's check that one real quick. Electron transport chain. Here we go. Oh, glycerol 3 phosphate. If we move through the glycerol 3 phosphate, that's the one where we're going to turn that NADH into an FADH2. If we go through malate aspartate, that's when it's going to be just treated like normal because that does not reduce its potential energy at all. Okay? So remember that one. Let's go back to our review. Here we go. And we want to be able to show the math for the ATP generator in each phase of metabolism. Okay, we know how many are in glycolysis, we know how many are in TCA cycle, and we know how many are in the electron transport chain, and that's going to equal our 32-ish overall. Fat metabolism, okay. How can we prove that fat has a greater energy production efficiency? We did that one. Let's go back and look at those notes real quick, though. We were zoomed in on that one. 
Oh, that was when we talked about the Q10 effect. Here's our fatty acid overall. Maybe in lecture number two, we did this one. Okay, here we go. This is where we did our math for our different phases of beta oxidation overall. And we saw that we got 460 per free fatty acid, okay? Oops. From one fatty acid or one fat molecule. And remember, we were only getting about 32 ATP from one glucose molecule. So obviously, we're going to be a lot more efficient there. Let's move back to our review. Distribution of fuel utilization change. Remember, with exercise intensity, the more intense we get, the more carbohydrate we're going to be using, the less amount of fat. At low exercise intensities, we're using a lot of fat. Triglyceride, we know that. That's our three free fatty acids in our glycerol backbone. The hormones, hormone-sensitive lipase, and our lipoprotein lipase. And then we have to know exactly where each of those act. So look back in your notes at that one right there. ACL-CoA less than 12 and more than 12, and that's going to be that they can diffuse through the mitochondria or not. Uh, I skipped one there. Uh, glycerol metabolized, that's going into liver. Remember, we get 19 ATPs from that one. Uh, difference between acyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA. Well, that's good. Well, basically, that acetyl-CoA is going to have a little bit different. Let's look at our figure, though. That'll be able to tell us right here. Lipid metabolism. If we look here... Here's our acyl-CoA outside. Here's our acyl-CoA once again. Our acetyl-CoA is our two-carbon unit. So the biggest difference there is that our acyl-CoA is larger than two carbons in length. That acetyl-CoA is very specific because that is what can go directly into the TCA cycle. Um, our acyl-CoA is going to be longer, so it can be four carbons in length, up to 18 carbons in length. That's still going to be considered acyl-CoA. Um, it doesn't really give you any information about how many carbons it is, but we know it's not two because that's what's going to be our acetyl-CoA with that T in there. Okay, we know the transporter. Okay, transferase is going to be helping us out with that one. We just had that picture up here, lipid metabolism. Okay, ACL transferase helping us out right there. That's going to move that in. Carnitine is going to get moved into, onto that right here, and then it's going to pop off once it gets back inside the mitochondria and then shuttle back outside of the uh, side of the mitochondria all right we talked about what happens after that four products of beta oxidation let's go right to that picture that'll help us remember here's fadh2 is one nadh is two Acetyl-CoA is three, and then our acyl-CoA that goes back into beta oxidation is going to be four. That would only change to three if it was the last phase and we were splitting that four-carbon acyl-CoA into two acetyl-CoAs. Okay, how many ATPs? We just talked about that one right there. That's going to be 460. Remember, 441 from the fatty acids themselves and 19 from the glycerol backbone. And then with exercise training, what happens to those overall? We know that with exercise training, our fat oxidation at low exercise intensity goes up and our carbohydrate oxidation at high intensity goes up. So that means our fat oxidation at high intensity actually goes down. And glycogen utilization as a result of endurance training, well, we use less glycogen 
at low exercise intensities so we are able to do some glycogen sparing. Remember, this is the figure that I had swapped backwards. Let's look at that one real quick just to refresh everybody's memory. It's going to be in our protein metabolism that was actually fat. It's this guy right here. So when we start, let's do this real quick. Maybe I can redeem myself partially. In an untrained capacity, you're going to have a curvilinear relationship between fat metabolism and exercise intensity, meaning that at a low exercise intensity, let's say 20, you're going to start with 80% of your fuel coming from fat. That's not going to change with or without training. At 20% of your exercise intensity, you're still going to have 80%. But as your exercise intensity increases in an untrained state, you see that we get a really fast drop off in that fat metabolism right away. When you are trained, you get a slower drop off in that fat metabolism. Slower drop off in that fat metabolism. Because that drop off is slower in that case, then for the same exercise intensity, so now let's say we're comparing 50% of your exercise uh, capacity pre training versus post training. Pre training, when you're down here, you're going to be only able to utilize about 25% of your energy expenditure from fat. So what that would mean is 75% of your energy expenditure would be having to come from carbohydrate. However, post-training, we're up here. So at that same 50% of your max, you are able to use 50% of fat. So to power your exercise at 50% of your exercise intensity capacity, 50% of your energy comes from fat, meaning that uh, only 50% is coming from carbohydrate. So pre to post training, we moved from 75% carbs down to 50% carbs. That carbohydrate savings overall is called our glycogen sparing. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit. Let's move on. Protein metabolism. Okay. Components of our amino acid, we know we have those three main components. Let's go back to this. Difference between this and previous semesters that I've had to cover from the book, but we actually covered it this, this uh, year. Okay, grams of protein, we talked about that one. And two reasons protein is important. Okay, let's go to protein metabolism number two, lecture number 17. Here we go. There we go. Three components, our amine group, our organic acid, and our R side chain overall. We know that adults only need about 0.8 to 0.9. Athletes go up about double, 1.2 to 1.8, depending on the type of athlete overall. And we know children overall have a much higher need. Uh, so understanding and knowing what those grams are per kilogram is going to be important. Okay. Why do we need, here's two reasons why it's important. Number one, because we make a lot of stuff in our body and it's not just skeletal muscle that we make with it. We make things like red blood cells, hormones, and our electron transporters right there. And then also the second reason that protein intake is gonna be important is because we use it for energy. You know, uh, previous to this lecture, we kind of talked about the main components of our uh, exercise metabolism being carbohydrate and fat, and that was pretty much all that was changing. But we know that we're going to have some uh, components of protein coming in there along the way. We talked about our, uh, our main branch chain amino acids, which are going to be our valine, our leucine, and our isoleucine, and the main points of those being that they had an aliphatic sign chain, they couldn't be aromatic like proline, they're nonpolar and they're hydrophobic, that makes them a key indicator of energy and protein excess in the body and was gonna help with protein synthesis. This is, this is the study that we talked about, how they determined that our branched chain amino acids were really important for being that trigger. 
And then this is where our protein get into the citric acid cycle to assist with our ability to metabolize amino acids and then turn them into ATP down the road. Because if we enter into the Krebs cycle right here, we know we're going to be able to, to produce those electron carriers, which will then move to the electron transport chain. Back to the review. Okay, protein metabolism, we talked about the changes, why is it important? Transamination and deamination, okay, this one we didn't talk about too much. Deamination is taking that uh, nitrogen off. We're taking the amine group off, okay, so that's what happens um, during our glucose alanine cycle. We take that uh, nitrogen off. Transamination is gonna be moving that. Where is that nitrogen located on our amino acid overall? Transamination is going to be that. So understanding the difference between those is important because when we go to our protein metabolism right here, when we are removing that nitrogen right there, we are completing our deamination. Okay, we are deaminating that to move it off of the branch chain amino acid, and then we are transaminating it when we are moving it on and combining it with glucose to make our glutamate. Okay, changing location, which stage of the TCA cycle? Okay, uh, understand the seven different places that that is going to be located. Five factors that influence protein. Nice. Let's go to that one real quick. I think it's this one right here. Yes, the five factors that uh, affect our protein synthesis are going to be the source. Is it fast digesting or slow digesting? What's the kind of dose? How many grams of that protein you're going to get? The timing, especially in relationship to when that resistance training protocol was um, undertaken. Number four, what's the pattern look like over the course of the day? And the last one is going to be our macronutrient co-ingestion overall. And understanding that alanine glucose cycle, knowing the steps of that is going to be really important. Okay, getting down there, last couple, lactate metabolism, and then our training adaptations. Mm-hmm. Well, those are our training adaptations. I think that was in our last lecture, actually, that we did our lactate. Here it is. Aha. Lactate threshold. Remember, the big thing about that is that's one, one millimole above our resting exercise, uh, our resting blood lactate concentration. If we want to talk about steady rate exercise overall, anything in here would be steady rate. And the reason that would be steady rate is because remember the analogy we used in class, we were talking about water pouring into a bucket that had a hole in the bottom. If that water pouring in is going to be able to be equaled by the water coming out of the bottom of the bucket, then we're at steady rate. If we're able to oxidize and transport and metabolize 100% of the lactate that we're generating at a minute-by-minute -minute basis, then we're at steady rate. That's generally going to be a lower exercise intensity. Okay, Lactate threshold, remember we said this is about, you know, uh, if we wanted to put an applied definition to this, generally that refers to a person running a 10K. So if they were running for about 30 to 45 minutes, what's the maximum pace that they can ma maintain for that entire time? And if you've ever run a 10K pretty hard, you know that's pretty challenging overall. Okay, so lactate threshold, one millimole above your resting. So if your resting is different between people, that means different people are going to have a different lactate, lactate threshold, which is very different than our onset of blood lactate accumulation, because that is an absolute number. Four millimoles across the board. Doesn't matter what your resting is. Once you reach four millimoles, that's typically where we see the second break point right here in our relationship between exercise intensity and blood lactate concentration. And we're going to relate that to some of your breathing mechanics in the next section overall. So there's our lactate. Steady rate, define lactate threshold. Yep. 
Which of those is dependent? Okay, training adaptations. Yes, these get pretty pretty uh, specific here with these ones. But remember, we only have one lecture on this, so there. If you wanted to focus on some more things, I would focus a little bit more on the carbohydrate and fat metabolism overall. And our three things that change. Yep, yep, yep. Good. So let's go back, go through this lecture real quick. We'll do lecture 18, hopefully. There it is. The main thing we talked about are cardiovascular changes right there. Plasma volume, stroke volume, heart rate, oxygen extraction, and blood transport. And remember, if we go back to it, that all relates to our VO2 and the three aspects of VO2 that are going to change due to aerobic training. And we know with that, our oxygen uptake you're not breathing in more oxygen when you train, but your transport and your utilization will change. So those are the things that we know are going to change. So if you look at this right here, because of our capillarization, we know that our extraction is going to change. That's our utilization right there. Because of these main things right here, we now need a lower heart rate and we have a which enables a higher stroke volume and higher plasma volume overall. They're all interrelated, but what that means is your heart has to work less hard for the same amount of work, okay? So before, you know, for example, if we did some aerobic training and you got on the treadmill and ran at seven miles per hour and your heart rate was 150 beats per minute, then you trained for six weeks, came back, jumped on the treadmill and ran at seven miles per hour once again, your heart rate at that uh, sub-maximal exercise intensity is going to be lower than 150. The reason that it's going to be lower than 150 is because you're better at extracting oxygen from the, the blood that's moving by your muscles, so you need less blood moving by them. You overall have a larger amount of blood uh, moving into your heart when it returns, and you're expanding your left ventricle more and ex, uh, ejecting more blood per heartbeat. So if you combine those two things together, per heartbeat, you're able to move more blood, plus per unit blood that moves by your uh, muscles, you're going to be able to extract more oxygen. Those two things together relate in you having a lower heart rate at submax. So basically, if you take one and two and four and five here, those three, th those five, four things together combine to mean a lower heart rate at submaximal exercise intensity. Overall, with our metabolic machinery, that's going to be our mitochondria. We know we're going to get increased number and increased density of those all overall. Yeah, this goes back to what we just talked about with VO2. What is meant by the statement, oxygen supply does not limit the oxidative capacity of an untrained muscle, meaning that, um, you know, if, if you were, you know, in one of those uh, dollar vacuum machines that has all the dollars floating around you, okay, and if you pumped more dollars into that, your ability to stuff them in your pockets is not going to really change too much. Okay, if you're already saturated, you're limited by your ability to put them in your pockets. That's what's limiting you. And the same thing happens with uh, exercise, with training. Being able to breathe in more oxygen into your lungs is not going to change the ability of your muscles to produce force with that oxygen. There's a lot of steps in between there that relate to the generation of ATP. And the main ones that are related to that are your ability to extract that oxygen in the first place, and that's done by your mitochondria. Okay, carbohydrate metabolism, we know that goes down at low intensity and up at high intensity. Mm -hmm. 
fat metabolism goes up at low intensity, down at high. And same thing right there. What type of athlete benefits most from improved fat metabolism? That's going to be a long distance endurance athlete because their exercise is going to create um, a lot lower exercise intensity on average. They're probably never getting above 80% of their max. And therefore, if they're able to uh, power themselves a little bit longer with the endogenous fuel that they have on board, they could be more successful. Lactate concentration is a function of, remember that's production and clearance. Remember, as we progress in those early stages of lactate production, if we're able to balance that out, then that's not necessarily going to be reflected in our lactate concentration. Our lactate concentration is lactate production minus clearance. Stroke volume, that's the amount of blood that you're pumping out of your heart per heartbeat. Four factors, we just talked about all four factors uh, a minute ago. This one we did not cover this semester. What heart rate is stroke volume the largest? I'll give you bonus points if you looked that up in the book, but overall we don't need to know that one for this exam because we didn't cover it. Heart rate changing, we just talked about that one as well. If heart rate decreases, what needs to happen to stroke volume in order to maintain cardiac output? It needs to go up. And then oxygen extraction, that's related to our mitochondria overall. So hopefully this has covered most of the study guide for everybody. Like I said, email me specific questions that you might have today. Uh, I'm going to make a second video tomorrow and I will post that again. And once I post that, if you have any other ones, email me throughout the day and I'll hopefully get those posted um, you know, on the day on Tuesday. So you can review that before the exam on Wednesday. Sorry again for the technical difficulties and we're going to get better at this throughout the semester.